Hi, I'm Jason Wright. I'm a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at Penn State University at the Center for Exoplanets and Habitable Worlds. And this talk is about RV planet signal fitting. What that means is you've measured the radial velocity of a star very precisely, and you've subtracted off very carefully the motion of the observatory so that all that remains in your data are the true center of mass motions of that star due to a planet orbiting it. And you want to infer the properties of that planet from the radial velocities you measured. And so this is how to fit those data, what the model is that you use to fit the data, and how you extract exoplanetary um, parameters from that model. So we start at the beginning with Kepler's laws. We expect that planets will orbit stars in ellipses with the star at one focus, or um, more precisely with the center of mass of the system at one focus. Um, the, these orbits ha are characterized by their physical size, given by their semi-major axis, uh, that is half the distance from the extreme points along the long axis of the ellipse, uh, and their eccentricity, which tells you how elliptical the orbits are. So we expect that when we do a measurement, we should be able to extract both of these parameters uh, somehow from our model. Uh, we can also get the orientation of the orbit. So here we're going to define a bunch of our variables in the problem that you use to define your model. So in this figure, um, Earth is up. We're looking down onto the system uh, as it goes around. And the radial component of the motions of the planet and the star uh, is the component of their motion up in this figure towards the Earth. The planet is little m there towards the top. Uh, and it's got this big elliptical orbit around the center of mass of the system. The star also has a counter orbit that's much smaller because it's more massive, about the same center of mass of the system. This is the same shape orbit as the planet. So this is something important to keep in mind. You're not measuring the planet. You're measuring the star. <clears throat> and uh, because they share a center of mass and you have to conserve center of mass, the star's orbit is just like the planet's orbit. It's just rotated 180 degrees and much, much smaller. So the planet is moving at tens of kilometers per second. We have to measure meter per second or smaller motions of the star and infer that the planet is doing, um, is causing it and has the same kind of orbit. So we're really measuring the orbit of the star and then inferring the planetary orbit because it's basically the same thing. The orientation of the orbit uh, in this figure in this plane uh, is given by the argument of periastron little omega. So this measures the where periastron is, that is closest approach of the planet to the star, with respect to the plane of the sky. Um, now there's a little confusion in the literature about whether we are describing the argument of periastron of the planet or of the star when we report it. Um, it's frankly kind of a mess, and it goes back to confusion about whether we use a left or right-handed coordinate system. If you get deeply involved in astrometry, you will encounter this ambiguity and just have to resolve it because the literature is inconsistent. But what you need to know for radial velocities is, however people define it, all these equations in this talk still work. When little omega is 90 degrees or pi over 2, that means that the planet is between the Earth and and the star, modulo and inclination, but it's, it's at its closest or conjunction, um, uh, when it's at periastron. So when periastron is between the star and the Earth, that's little omega is 90 degrees or pi over 2. The um, other angle that we need uh, is the one that's a function of time, because what we're measuring is a model that is a function of time. Uh, and so we need to know how to connect the geometric parameters here of this orbit um, to the radial velocities we get as a function of time, and that comes through the true anomaly. The true anomaly is just an angle. It's literally just uh, how far the planet has gone around the star, you know, measured in radians or degrees. Unfortunately, it doesn't evolve uniformly with time, and that's again from Kepler's laws. When the planet is close to the star, it moves faster, so the true anomaly increases quickly with time, and then at apastron, when it's far away, it changes more slowly. So in order to build a model, we have to know how the true anomaly changes with time because it's non-uniform. And this was Kepler's great contribution. These two equations uh, will link
the time since the star has been uh, since the star and the planet have been at Perry uh, to the actual angle that the planet has gone around the center of mass. So the first step is to use what's called Kepler's equation. It's a nonlinear equation, and you have to solve it uh, numerically or iteratively. It doesn't have an analytic solution. So first, Kepler defined an intermediate variable called the mean anomaly. So this is an angle, uh, and, but it's not an angle that's in that figure that I showed before, at least it's not as far as I know. Um, it's just an angle that changes uniformly in time. So we're going to take the time since Perry passage, which we denote T naught. Um, uh, so T minus T naught is just how much time has elapsed since the planet was last at Perry. We'll divide by the period and multiply by 2 pi. So that means that when the planet goes around once, the mean anomaly will go from 0 all the way up to 2 pi, and we get to start over again. So um, 0, mean anomaly, or 2 pi or 4 pi, that's peri. And pi, or 3 pi or 5 pi, that's uh, ap astron when they're farthest apart. But in between, it doesn't correspond exactly to the true anomaly, because it's moving uniformly, and the true anomaly is not. Next, Kepler defined another intermediate variable called the eccentric anomaly. Uh, and it's defined such that the mean anomaly is the eccentric anomaly minus the eccentricity times the sine of the eccentric anomaly. And so that's the nonlinear part. If you want to solve for the eccentric anomaly given m, you need to do it iteratively. If you have a good first guess, it converges very quickly. Uh, there's a paper by Danby that has an extremely efficient way to solve this, even for uh, high eccentricities. Nonetheless, if you're doing a lot of orbit fitting, sometimes this can be the slow step in the calculation. Once you solve for the eccentric anomaly, uh, then you can plug it into the second equation down there, uh, which is analytic. You just take an arctangent, and uh, you can get the, uh, the true anomaly. So now we know how to now we know how the true anomaly evolves with time. It's defined implicitly by these two equations. Uh, and oh, by the way, here we've introduced uh, a couple of new um, uh, pr fundamental orbital parameters. The time of periastron passage, which is pretty self-explanatory. You just um, you're solving for some time, presumably during your observations when that would have happened, and you're solving for the period of the orbit. But the period of the orbit is connected to the physical size that we described earlier, A, uh, through Kepler's third law. So the period squared measured in years times the sum of the masses of the, the star and the planet measured in solar masses is equal to the semi-major axis in AU cubed. So the radial velocity you get from such an orbit can look like the charts I show there below, and it's described by the equation up above. That is, the equation up above uh, produces the curves down below. Uh, the x-axis on the curves down below is true uh, uh, is, uh, is time. Sorry, the, the x-axis on the charts down below is time. The true anomaly is defined in terms of that through the equations we just saw. And then the y-axis is the radial velocity given by this equation. So let's take the uh, equation apart and see what each of the pieces are so that we can understand how they relate to, um, to the physical properties in the system and to, the, um, and to these curves. So we already know little omega, the argument of periastron, and we already know the eccentricity E, because that's the eccentricity of the orbit. New here is the RV semi-amplitude, uh, which is halfway from maximum to minimum on these plots in the vertical direction. So the maximum RV to the minimum RV, half of that is the semi-amplitude. And so that's just uh, an amplitude that goes out in front of this time dependence term. The gamma, all the way on the right, um, that's an RV zero point, and this is just the, the overall offset of these curves from zero, and uh, this can depend on the method of observation. If you think you're measuring absolute radial velocities, uh, then it represents the just the bulk motion of the exoplanetary system through space. Um, and then the true anomaly we've already seen, it contains the time of periastron passage and it contains the period. Uh, that is, you need to, to know those things in order to calculate it. So if we count up the number of things, the, the number of parameters that go into this radial velocity model, 
Uh, we have the argument of periastron passage, which we're trying to determine from the radial velocities, the eccentricity, the RV semi-amplitude, the RV zero point, the time of peri passage, and the period. So there are six orbital parameters that we need to solve for, one of which is an RV zero point. If you were solving for two planets around the same star, as we'll see later, um, five of these orbital parameters you also have to solve for the second planet. The RV zero point, though, is common to the data set. It's not, it's not really an orbital parameter. It's a, sort of a nuisance parameter. So there are five orbital parameters per star plus an RV zero point that you need to solve for. Now, there are other things that we'd like to know about the orbit, but we just are not allowed to know those from radial velocity measurements alone. The first is the inclination of the orbit with respect to the plane of the sky, whether it's face-on orbit or an edge-on orbit. Um, we can't get that. It's completely degenerate with k, unfortunately. So uh, if it's edge-on, then k is the total motion of the orbit. But if, it's, uh, if the system is face-on, that is, if i is near 0, uh, then k is only, only measures a very small component of the motion along the line of sight, and so we only get the, uh, a lower limit on the, the amplitude. The other is big omega. Big omega is called the longitude of the ascending node. Basically, it's the orientation of the orbit on the plane of the sky. Before, little omega was the orientation of the orbit towards Earth or away from Earth. This is just um, clocking it on the plane of the sky, and we have no way to access that information at all from radial velocities. It has no effect on our interpretation. Um, you can only determine it through astrometry, uh, or you can get constraints on it from a few other clever tricks you can play in certain sorts of systems. Um, it can be important if you're looking at the dynamics of multiple planet systems or something like that, but you um, rarely have access to it through radial velocities. Okay, so these are the sorts of curves that that model produces. This is basically the full set of radial velocity curves that you can get uh, from a single planet. So the, the left-hand column here, uh, these are just sinusoids. So if you have a circular orbit, E equals zero, you get a sinusoidal signal, and uh, little omega just measures the, uh, the phase of that signal. And there's no periastron for a circular orbit, so it's completely degenerate with the time of periastron. Uh, so in E is zero, you have this degeneracy between T naught and omega. Now, when you, uh, as soon as you have any eccentricity, the time of peri passage is well defined. Um, and depending on the orientation of the orbit uh, with little omega, you get different looking curves. So you can get kind of these hills up at the top. If little omega is zero, all of the top row is omega zero. And down at the bottom, you see if omega is 90, you get something that's looking maybe a little more like a sawtooth or something like that. Uh, when you go up to E of 0.6 in the third column, you see things are getting a little bit peakier. You're now getting long periods of time where the star isn't really changing its, uh, its velocity very much. Uh, and that's because apastron is happening at an orientation there at omega equals zero. Um, such that uh, all the motion is in the plane of the sky, it's not radial. Uh, and so you just don't see much of the acceleration, and it's only during periastron passages that you see a lot of acceleration. Now, at omega 90, you see it's the other way around. Uh, apastron is happening when the acceleration is along our line of sight, and so we get this long, almost straight, um, you know, pretty close to sawtooth signal. When you get eccentricities of around 0.9 all the way on the right, all the action happens at peri, and it doesn't take very long to happen at all. And so you can have long stretches almost no matter what uh, omega is, where things are changing very, very slowly, and then suddenly you'll get a spike. These planets can be tricky to detect, because you might ob observe something for quite a while and never see any change, and get bored and stop observing it and say, okay, there's nothing there, and you just happen to miss all of the periastron passages. I've, I've seen systems like that that seem to be good standards, and then we'd occasionally get this really high point uh, and thought, oh, that's a weird outlier. But then it kept happening, and eventually we discovered that it's a highly eccentric planet. They're not very common, though. So this is the full family of RV curves, and when you play this game a lot, uh, you learn to recognize them. And for high amplitude planets, you can sometimes just read off E and omega uh, by I. So we want to interpret uh, these parameters to get at the physical properties of the system. Uh, the semi-amplitude is, like I said, half of the, the span of the radial velocities of the star. 
Uh, and if you work out the math, which I will not do, the second line here shows that it's uh, it's given by this coefficient out front with uh, e and omega, which describe the shape of the orbit, uh, times this other quantity to the one-third power. So this other quantity uh, is very important, especially in binary star work. It's called the mass function, and it's what you can determine about the masses of the components in a binary radio, uh, radio velocity spectroscopic binary. So um, it's a little complicated. It's the cube of the mass of the planet, or the secondary star, the one you don't see, times the cube of the sine of the inclination. So if it's a face on orbit, inclination is zero, and so the mass function is zero, which makes sense because you don't see any radio velocities in a face on orbit. For an edge on orbit, i is pi over two, and so sine is one, and you see all of it, and k is maximized. And then you have to divide by the sum of the masses of the two components of the binary squared. And this, uh, you can see on the right hand side, comes entirely from things that you can fit with your model. It comes from the semi-amplitude cubed, the period, and you can measure the period because you see it uh, repeat it's in your model, the eccentricity, uh, and then some constants on the bottom. So the mass function for binary stars is all you know, and you'll notice that unless you have some other information, you don't actually know the masses of the individual components in the spectroscopic binary. You need to see uh, something else, you have to use stellar, what you know about stars, or see the lines from the secondary, or you need something to break the degeneracy. Um, and so uh, this was often the, the quantity that would be reported uh, in stellar binary work. The reason you almost never see this in exoplanets is because you can simplify it. Um, you'll notice that on the right-hand side we've added the mass of the star to the mass of the planet. Uh, when you do that, the mass of the planet rarely matters. So um, in truth, when we solve for the mass of the planet, minimum mass m sin i, we don't make this following approximation. You don't need to, but conceptually it's easiest to just imagine that we can neglect the mass of the planet in the denominator on the right-hand side. And if you do that, uh, then things simplify. You can then just take the one-third power of things, and you see that k is approximately proportional to the mass of the planet times the sine of its i. Uh, sign of its inclination, and the denominator is the mass of the star to the two-thirds power. And if you think you know the mass of the star because you understand stellar astrophysics, then you end up with a linear relationship between the mass of the planet and k. And again, to emphasize, when you actually report the minimum mass of the planet, you actually solve this upper equation uh, for little m, and it converges very quickly. Um, so we often refer to the minimum mass of the planet. For shorthand, we will often just say m sine i, even though what we really mean is the m implied by the mass function. But this approximation helps it keep clear in our minds um, that it's almost exactly linear. Uh, it's usually an extremely small correction you have to make for the mass of the planet. So if we make that approximation just for uh, illustrative purposes, we see that the semi-amplitude uh, plugging in some characteristic numbers. So if you have a one Jupiter mass planet around a one solar mass star in a circular orbit with a one year period, its amplitude is 28.4 meters per second. Uh, real Jupiter has an eccentricity of about um, 5% or so, so we can basically neglect it here. Its period, though, is 12 years, and so when you take 12 to the one-third and divide it out, you get about 12 meters per second for Jupiter. So when you see someone say we've measured m sin i, what they really mean is the minimum mass, uh, but it's close enough to m sin i, uh, and it's proportional to k the semi-amplitude. So if you see twice the semi-amplitude, the planet is twice as massive. Uh, the mass of the star to the two-thirds power. So there's some uncertainty on the mass of the planet due to that. Uh, and then period to the one-third power. So more distant planets uh, move their star more slowly. And so uh, the uh, uh, you take a, it requires a more massive planet to induce the same radio velocity amplitude. Now, the Sinai ambiguity means that uh, you've only got this minimum mass, but the truth is most systems are near edge-on. There are many more geometric ways for a system to be edge-on than pole-on. Uh, 
Um, and so if you work out the, the median magnitude of one over sine I, uh, uh, the, the error introduced by, by uh, not knowing the inclination, the, the median value of one over sine I is 1.15. So about a 15% error is typical. Now, if it's a really face on system, you can get burned and it can be many times more massive than you've measured. But in general, if you just inflate the numbers for minimum masses by about 15%, then you know, you'll, you'll, um, you'll be basically getting the right uh, value for most of them modulo that very long tail. So that's the story for a single planet, but um, lots of stars have more than one planet. In fact, probably most stars have multiple planets, and we're starting to find lots of complex systems with lots and lots of planets. So you might wonder, um, that's going to make a very complex waveform, and what are we going to do about it? The good news is that, to first order, the signals of multiple planets just add linearly together, which means your model can just uh, be the sum of two single planet models plus the RV offset. So uh, I'm going to take some examples from Kat Feng's uh, undergraduate thesis uh, that she did with me to show some nice examples. So here are radial velocity curves of uh, GJ849, which is orbited by two giant planets. Uh, and you can see there you've just got this, this waveform that looks like the sum of two sinusoids, because it is. And there the two sinusoids are down at the bottom. They're not exact sinusoids, but they're pretty close to zero eccentricity. Um, and so you can decompose it into the sum of two signals, and there she's phased them up so that you can see what they look like. Um, now, the periods are sometimes very far apart. Here's a famous system, again from Kat's paper, 217107. Uh, where it has a close-in planet with a very large radial velocity, and then there's a very long period component. And so by eye, you can see there's a high-frequency component and a low-frequency component, and they just decompose pretty straightforwardly. So sometimes you can do that by eye. Here's another uh, famous system from Deborah Fisher's classic paper in 2008 on 55 Cancri. Uh, and you can see, just like uh, with 217107, you've got a high frequency component and a low frequency component. And indeed, they, they fit out very quickly uh, and easily. But the interesting thing about 55 Cancri, well, one of many interesting things, is that when you subtract those two obvious signals at 14 and a half days and at 5200 days, um, there's still a mess, there's still power. And so when you can't just see them by eye and decompose them, the usual thing to do is to move to a space where planetary systems should be quite distinct. And so what we usually do is move into frequency space by taking a periodogram. So a periodogram uh, is sort of like a Fourier transform, except uh, it applies to systems with unevenly sampled data. For a Fourier transform, you have to have exactly periodically sampled data, and we never really have that with radial velocities. So um, to construct one of these things, you just fit sinusoids at a lot of trial periods and report the amplitudes of the best fit sinusoid at each period, uh, and you let the phase drift. Um, and so if you subtract off those two planets from 55 Cancri, and then you do a whole bunch of trial periods, you see these spikes. And there's a lot more spikes here than you would typically see. Um, if, if you had truly Gaussian noise, this would look like Gaussian noise, this, this periodogram. Um, but you don't. You see some very tall spikes. So there's a nice spike there at 44... Uh, 0.3 days, for instance, and indeed that is a third planet in the system. And interestingly, if you subtract that signal off, you have two more quite tall periods at 2.8 days and 260 days. You subtract off the 2.8 day planet, and sure enough, there's the 260. Now it's moved out to 261 after the subtraction. And that's a planet as well. So after you take out the first two planets, the periodogram had all these peaks, but only some of them were due to planets. So the 44.3 day system, that was C, the, uh, the, the 2.8 day signal, that was E, the 260 day signal, that was F, but that 88.7 day peak, that turned out to be power from planet C, a harmonic of the power there leaking out into 88 days, and the 470 day signal was nothing. So you can't trust periodograms to tell you if planets are real. You can't even 
uh, trust them to represent different planets because power can go into the wrong periods when you assume everything is a sinusoid and you beat against your uh, wacky um, observing windows of when you happened to sample. So this is called aliasing, when power that is truly at one uh, frequency or a frequency and its harmonics shows up at another frequency because of how you sample the data. So periodograms are extremely powerful ways to explore your data, to characterize your data, but you have to be very careful about pointing to a peak and saying that's a planet. Uh, because they can fool you. And indeed, this is a classic case of getting fooled by that because that E component at 2.8 days, that's not actually the period of the planet. And I remember getting into a raging argument with Dan Fabricke about whether that period was right, and I was completely wrong, and he was totally right. Uh, he, uh, Becky Dawson and he published this lovely paper about de-aliasing radial velocity planets. And um, the, the, their conclusion, or one of their many conclusions, was that 55 Cancri E had the wrong published period and that the correct period for the planet was in fact 0.7 days, the, the shortest period known uh, of any exoplanet at the time. Um, and uh, part of that was just that the, um, uh, the periodogram didn't go to short enough periods to even notice that. We didn't think back then that there would be planets at such short periods, and it's ex it was expensive to compute the periodograms then, and so um, we just didn't even uh, check very often for that sort of thing. Um, uh, and uh, as a result of this, having a shorter period, that meant that the transit probability, and the transit times, of course, uh, of the planet, the, the transit probability was quite high, and the transit times were not what what we thought they might be. Um, and so with such a short period and a good ephemeris, uh, there was a Spitzer program to go and see if maybe 55 Cancri E did transit at the correct period. Uh, and sure enough, uh, it did. Josh Wynn had this uh, nice paper using um, uh, photometry to detect the transit of 55 Cancri E. Uh, and it is now one of the most important exoplanets we know around a bright V of six star, uh, this very close in planet transiting. So uh, beware of periodograms and make sure you're carefully monitoring your data and make sure you think hard about aliasing by looking at um, uh, all the places power can go. So the other way that um, the model I've just described can fail you uh, is uh, planet-planet interactions. So when you have two um, planets or more orbiting a star, they can accelerate each other, and then that alters their orbits to be not Keplerian, and so we lose the entire, um, uh, the, the, the model is just incorrect. So uh, this is a figure from Rivera and Lissauer where Eugenio uh, modeled the two planets in GJ876, um, GJ876 has two giant planets around it in a two to one resonance. And so there are strong dynamical interactions between, uh, between the two planets. And this is just uh, one of the early figures uh, they produced describing how they fit it. So here they are not using the radial velocity model I described. They're actually doing a dynamical simulation of the two planets and the star together. Uh, and asking what the velocity is towards the Earth. And the answer is very different than you get from a, uh, a kinematic or Keplerian solution uh, that I had been describing. You get very different periods, actually, for the planets when you do it this way, partially because their orbits are precessing. Uh, it's a difference between a sidereal period and, a, and an orbital period. But uh, anyway, you get this complex radial velocity curve. They fit the data to it extremely well. Uh, and Eugenio just kept working on this, and as more and more data came in, this dynamical model became very powerful, because just fitting kinematically, you would have completely missed the fact that underneath all of this, those residuals you see there are actually too large, there's a period in there too, and there is another planet, GJ876D, uh, quite close in, orbiting the star, uh, which Eugenio published in 2005. And then after five more years of monitoring and continuing to do these dynamical situations, uh, simulations, 
uh, they found that it's not just a two to one resonance. There's actually it's a four to two to one resonance. There's a small planet outside the other two, GG 876e, as well. So the bottom line is that for complex systems where um, you've got uh, more than just one planet around the star, uh, you need to be careful to make sure that you uh, you don't need to take these into account. And if you do need to take them into account, you actually have to fit the data to a dynamical simulation. So those are my slides. Thank you for uh, watching and um, enjoy the rest of the workshop.